Dr. Malone is someone that I really look up to. Never in my life would I have ever thought of truth would be something that would be so debated. There's so many different opinions out there that are being called truth that may not necessarily be truth, and so many truths that now are being called misinformation, disinformation, whatever. A lot of people know in their gut something's wrong. They know when something's right deep down that freedom is being eroded in real time. And the purchasing of influencers, musicians, comedians, etc., all happen in a harmonized, simultaneous fashion across the Western world. And then you have to ask your, yourself the question, what organization has the power and capabilities to implement something like that? They frame the whole legal system as an opportunity to forward an activist agenda in the world. And I remember thinking to myself, our legal institutions are just gone. You, you couldn't make this up. It, this is too perfect. Oh no, you'd throw this out, this script this script would be considered absurd. And it justifies the position that this was on purpose. I'll say this, out of all the guests that uh, we have on the show, this one I am very intrigued to bring to you guys. Dr. Malone is someone that I really look up to, and I think in a, in a society where truth is such a very interesting topic, even something as simple as truth, never in my life would I have ever thought of truth would be something that would be so debated so dialogued and discussed um, and there's so many different opinions out there that are being called truth that may not necessarily be truth and so many truths that now are being called misinformation disinformation whatever it's kind of hard for people to navigate the, the, where, where their logic exists in truth but i think deep down especially over these last five years a lot of people know in their gut something's wrong they know when something's right deep down but um Having you, someone like you, and and you know, out there speaking truth, especially after all the criticism you face, all the backlash, I just got to say, number one, I admire your courage and your strength and your conviction, and just know there's a ton of us people like me and Matt out here oh, that support the hell out of you, and and um, we encourage you to keep fighting for the truth and um, and for the people out there that that recognize that freedom is being. Uh, eroded in real time, Dr. Malone. So anyway, welcome to the show, Man on a Mission. Welcome, and, Dr. Uh, Malone. Yeah, really excited to do this. So thanks a lot for that tee up, Eric, and, and for the kind words from both of you. I just finished a little uh, four city tour over the last three days that was kind of brutal. But uh, mm -hmm. most of what I spoke about was uh, the Psy War that's going on and its impact on sovereignty. And uh, mm -hmm. It's a perfect segue to your comments about truth. I argue that the character is that the characteristic of postmodern society, which is what we're in right now, and particularly societies where governments have felt comfortable deploying psy war or psy ops technology on their citizenry, is that mm -hmm. truth has become entirely subjective. Truth has become what you assert it to be. If you are the one with sufficient power in media and <laughs> in social media to uh, dominate the idea space, that that becomes truth, whatever that is. So we're, it is fully full on a post-truth environment in which yeah. truth is entirely subjective and actively molded by a variety of different actors. And I think that we can see, in, in, no matter what you think about the Gaza Strip and the IDF and that conflict right now, I think it's a fascinating uh, exercise in watching two highly developed psi war capabilities go head to head. And uh, yeah. that that is an information battle space that if nothing else, it's a fascinating case study in seeing what modern psi war and postmodern reality is going to be like. And of course, it's only going to get worse as we develop yeah. a deep fake technology even further. I mean, I think by the time <laughs> the election rolls around, um, our, our concept of truth is, is going to be just stretched to the limit. Yeah. And in particular, That's scary. how to, our, our, the traditional way one would discern truth versus uh, the lack of truth, or how to, how, how to discern what's real seems to be the crisis of our time. Yeah, and, and traditionally people have used it be, by relying on trusted messengers. And this is the problem with the deep corruption of all those entities that many of us at one point in our life believed were trusted messengers. And, you know, notably the New York Times and the Washington Post and the large broadcasters. 
And, and the evidence is quite clear that they've all been captured. Now, you made a comment earlier, Eric, that this is uh, unprecedented in uh, modern politics. But I've been uh, reviewing and reading the church report uh, from the 60s uh, with uh, Operation COINTELPRO from the FBI and Mockingbird from the CIA. And as I go through it, I'm, it's like a checklist. Oh, yeah, they're doing that now. They're doing that now. They're doing that now. They're doing that now. All these things they said they weren't going to do anymore, they're back on the stage and, and uh, doing it in space. Sure. But with new technology, you know, they've got new toys to do all that yeah. dirty trick stuff with. Yeah, and I feel like even in the, the 60s, uh, humans were just different, number one, in America per se. But beyond that, they didn't have the full wing of, of, the, uh, of the media. Like, you know, there was still the Walter Cronkites or like, you know, sort of the... It just these these people now Mess, are so far yeah they're corrupted. they're so far off the scale uh, where now we're questioning things like biology and they're trying to justify it and simplify it in ways that I thought that was sacred for a little boy or a little girl like now this I mean they've just taken it so far it it, it may have always been around but it was a lot more subtle it's almost like they're going for broke with this where they're taking it so far that every deep down in your soul you know this is this is not well, that's right it. Like you, yeah. you just said it this is right this is overreach um and that yeah. that is a major failing in advancing particularly black propaganda which is what a lot of this is um, right. is yeah. black propaganda and great propaganda re rely on the messenger being perceived as legitimate and right. as, as we all perceive, you know, get more sophisticated, that's why I teach, uh, frankly, that's why I teach about fifth gen warfare and propaganda is I'm trying to educate crowds so that they can see through this stuff, understand the technology sure. that's being deployed against them. But back then, um, we had trusted messengers uh, that we felt yeah. like we could rely on, you know, as in retrospect, they were probably being spun, but maybe not as much. And the other thing sure. was that we had a standard of journalism that was being taught in J schools that was a far more committed to a certain amount of ethics and objectivity. And now what, what is taught in J schools, uh, journalism schools, is called advocacy journalism, which is really yeah. a euphemism for propaganda. And uh, the, 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 the wedge that drove advocacy journalism into the leading J schools in the United States and then trickled down to all the others were large grants given by, wait for it, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I believe it. I, my sister, even not only in journalism, my sister graduated from law school in Seattle, University of Washington, maybe, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago. I remember sitting in the audience and the outright applauding of activism. Like it was almost like the, the graduating speakers, they framed the whole legal system as an opportunity to forward an activist agenda in the world, and everybody was applauding. Yep. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, yep. like our legal institutions are just gone. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. But with, with COVID, it seems like they, they, they literally, like warp speed, just fastly pushed some of these bizarre narratives, almost like they're going for broke. They're leaving, like they're like all their wildest fantasies of, and I keep saying they, that's a, another important question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who is they, so the yeah. they, which I'm sure the we'll talk about. is CISA uh, within the Department of Homeland Security. These are the group that uh, the Fifth District Court put an injunction against saying that you can't be cooperating with social media, um, uh, CISA and specifically. They're the, they're the hub within Department of Homeland Security. But in addition, uh, we, we absolutely have CIA, FBI, and uh, uh, defense intelligence, and in particular, uh, the CYWAR groups within Department of Defense have been authorized uh, to proceed. And the majority of the CYWAR capabilities and infrastructure actually resides within U.S. Army Reserve. Wild. So, okay, some of the decision-making process about about really these really bold decisions that must be being made at these high levels, who's above them? Like, it, it, it's so hard, to, it's so easy to sort of talk about all the problems, 
But what I always want to talk about is stuff that we see in front of us is like, well, who's behind it and what's the end game? What's the why behind so, it? Like, so why I've, would I want to do this? I've come to the conclusion because what you may or may not be attuned to, and your comments earlier were suggesting that you were more USA centric, go team USA. Uh, but uh, if you had had the opportunity to travel the world like I have had to over the last few years, you would know that the same exact things down to the same language being used yeah. and the purchasing of influencers, musicians, comedians, etc., all happen in a harmonized, simultaneous fashion across the Western world. And then you have Amazing. to ask your, yourself the question, what organization has the power and capabilities yeah. to implement something like that? And the answer, in my mind, is the CIA and the Five Eyes Alliance. The CIA is is credibly asserted to be the most powerful organization in the world and is increasingly autonomous because they have in QTEL their own venture capital firm. So they really don't completely rely on congressional funding and therefore they're free of congressional oversight. It's important to remember the CIA um, was uh, central to the formation of the World Economic Forum and the G20. Sure. Yeah, that was where I was leading is actually that World Economic Forum. What is their role in this and in their control over organizations like the CIA? So uh, we actually had, remember there's WEF has a treaty with UN and WHO. WHO is a division of UN functionally. WHO's second largest contributor, I think the first is Germany. Second largest contributor is Bill Gates. Uh, wow. And um, they're all linked together by treaty. And we've had one of the big issues we haven't kind of mentioned yet in this in this segment is the international health regulations modifications that are coming at us. And there was a big event yesterday, I think it was, or Friday, uh, in that the House has voted to uh, restrict uh to, the House has voted to withdraw from the World Economic Forum. Uh, and now that's up to the Senate. And furthermore, in that legislation, uh, they put a clause in there that um, the any, any of these agreements, this is the way they've been backdooring this, is things that the rest of the world considers to be treaties. They've been calling presidential agreements here in the United States in order to sidestep mm -hmm. senatorial approval. And so uh, the House put language into this new bill that they passed, bless their hearts, uh, that the Senate uh, must uh, agree. Uh, they didn't use the usual language of ratify that would be used for a treaty. Um, they said the Senate had to agree with a two-thirds vote um, to any of these presidential agreements with uh, with the World Health Organization, uh, specifically targeting the international health regulations that so many have complained about. Just to give a shout out, Reggie Littlejohn is the person that really deserves the credit hmm. for spearheading that. Uh, many others have contributed, but she has absolutely just been a warrior on this issue. Wow. So that yeah. passes the House, now what? Well, then it's up to the Senate. And uh, the House put an interesting clause in this, kind of a hook. Um, that that by by putting in this uh, language, they are actually proposing to give the Senate power over the executive branch. So, I think I think this is uh, a little bit of a carrot uh, to the Senate mm -hmm. uh, to entice them uh, to go along with this, and we'll see. You know, this is a true test of uh, the extent to which the Senate reflects globalism interests and uh, as many have sure. accused, uh, represents the uniparty where everything is tied together. But this still doesn't answer the question, who's the puppet master? If it's the CIA, well then who's above the CIA? Um, yeah. And uh, I think, I don't think the evidence supports Klaus Schwab. There's, you know, there's all these theories that it's the uh, um, Bank of International Settlements and the Network of International Banks, Central Banks, that's actually the puppet master. There's the uh, BlackRock State Street Vanguard uh, interlaced uh, massive uh, investment fund that, you know, is, is soon going to be controlling the majority of U.S. corporations if it isn't already. 
there's that theory. There's uh, um, theories having to do with ancient European aristocracy. Uh, there's various named individuals that are associated with certain ethnic groups that I'm not going to go there. Uh, and, um, you know, the theories go on and on and on. But one of the ones that's uh, floating up, bubbling up recently, is that there's a cabal of true deep staters, uh, Pompeo being a notable example, uh, mm -hmm. that are kind of sitting above the biosecurity intelligence apparatus and uh, op, you know, D, D, deep DC folk uh, that are highly influential, that are colluding, and they're on both sides of the aisle, uh, and, and they're colluding both to advance their own economic interests and power interests, and they may be the ones that are kind of the puppet masters of hmm. the intelligence community, and then the intelligence community is functionally the operating arm for a whole lot of this. Of course, as I've discussed in prior podcasts, it's the intelligence community through uh, DOD, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, CIA, HHS slash NIH, uh, State Department, USAID, as was testified by Bob Redfield, that funded the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China to do the engineering that produced the virus. I've, you know, this is like uh, who's on first. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of good guys that I'm sure work in the CIA and good people that are working in different agencies and government. But there's definitely someone that's pulling the strings. It's a profound question. But you, you know, you kind of led us to Wuhan um, and and COVID. You know, I first heard about you when I when I first stumbled onto you was Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan yeah. really helped popularize your message, and um, and from there I've been I've been hooked ever since. Yeah, because I, I, after that hit, I started getting fist bumps from young male 20 somethings yeah. on the street. There you go. Uh, awesome. And I was like, oh, this is really weird. I've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Joe, that's the Joe Rogan effect for sure. Yeah. But uh, it, was, it was really profound to hear someone, not only, you know, someone incredibly intelligent, but in, in, a, in a doctor at that, but it was, it was kind of going against the grain, which was really intriguing in and of itself. But it happened to be the doctor that is the inventor and the creator of the mRNA vaccine. Or the technology, and so, not these vaccines. The, well, the tech, you're right, right, the technology behind it. <laughs> well, Curry, Roger right. Weissman just got the Nobel for Correct these it. vaccines, not for yeah. the platform. But regardless, that is that was really it, that was really telling for a lot of people that were looking at this and saying, "Okay, this is this is something well, that's and worth remember, looking it at." It came on the heels of Joe having been infected, and yeah. then going live saying the unsayable that he was taking ivermectin, and that just generated a shitstorm yeah. of enormous proportions. Yeah, uh, and then yes. and then um, uh, right right before me. Uh, there was another hit uh, with um, Peter McCullough, uh, in which Peter was yes. his usual academic uh, self nerd, uh, citing references and everything. I think that didn't hit as hard as it did. The, the 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 coaching I got as I went in to see Mr. Rogan was to be really mo in the moment and really focused yeah. on him, and uh, Peter called me up right before and he was like, oh, you need to bring your laptop in and cite this reference and that reference and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, no, 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 that's not the way I'm going to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not Joe yeah. Rogan. And that's not that audience. Yeah. Uh, so I, I got good coaching. Uh, you know, for me, this is all a bizarre, um, unexpected uh, trip yeah. through modern media. And uh, I, I need all the coaching I can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This doesn't come natural. Well, you uh, on that Rogan show. If I correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you really what what ripped through the country was your comments around mass formation psychosis. That, I, like, I like to say. I, so this is the one liner I always get a laugh at from audiences when I'm speaking. I say, um, I said mass formation psychosis, and the entire Silicon Valley lost bladder control. Um, mm. Oh, totally. Yeah. And, oh, every every. Yeah, that's. And I have, a, I have a question that kind of goes back to your remarks earlier on this show with us. As you, you're saying, they're over, they're, they've gone so far, there's a backlash. Are people going to be rattled out of that mass hypnosis, so to speak? Are, do you, are you hopeful that people are so, increasing in their discernment capacity? So 
I thought that last January, February of 2023, um, there was kind of a lull in the propaganda. And yeah. the data were coming out uh, very consistent with what I had said a full year before uh, on Rogan. And uh, been, you know, excoriated, just ripped. <laughs> they they yeah. ripped me up one side and down the other. Business Insider, I think, has one of the... Uh, the best hit pieces, uh, but then New York Times and, you know, and before that, the Atlantic Monthly and Washington Post and blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, all of that over time, you know, over in the succeeding year, it pretty much all came true the way that I right. had said it was. And the data came in more robustly. Uh, and, um, and for those that don't know, doctor, could you slip it in really quick? Just give a really quick brief, attach that to what you're saying to maybe listeners that aren't exactly familiar with what we're talking about. Sort of some of the, the bomb that was dropped, a little bit of exposure to that before, you know, or, you know, or after, but attach that to your message here just for people that aren't aware of context. what we're talking about. Well, it, it was, I had done a prior hit uh, that went pretty big. I thought it was big. Uh, with Brett Weinstein on the Dark Horse podcast with Steve Kirsch, and then had done just a blizzard of uh, small podcasts uh, under the under the thought that well, if I'm the only way I'm going to be able to fight corporate media is to just go whole hog into alternative media, yeah. and that included three days in a row with Glenn Beck, which I understand was unprecedented, and and deciding you know I was like mm. oh my god this is like Alex Jones I'm not sure I can do this. Uh, but that worked out really well. And then uh, um, Steve Bannon has become a good friend, and I'm a friend of his, his show and others. So it kind of gradually built. And then I just walked into uh, Joe, and Joe had done his homework, uh, as is often the case. And uh, I think he was pretty pretty motivated on this issue. And, and he asked all kinds of questions. He asked about the... Uh, Perverse financial incentives to hospitals. Uh, he asked about the vaccine safety and effectiveness and uh, um, the adverse events. Uh, he he was familiar with the mass formation psychosis hypothesis of Matthias Desmet, and he asked me to recap that. Uh, so we kind of skated across a broad range of stuff. And the, the whole setup for this, the reason why I was placed on that broadcast was because uh, there was a big protest that was scheduled in Washington, D.C. for January, which was the first Stop the Mandates protest that was held on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, so ostensibly, this was supposed to be a push uh, opportunity, a marketing opportunity for that Stop the Mandates rally. And uh, I completely forgot to mention it. So did Joe, and so we had we had to go back in afterwards, uh, which is why in the last little clip he's got his dog uh, named Snoop, uh, Snoop the dog, uh, with him during that. And uh, yeah, you just got it. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't. Know that. <laughs> so, so that's so that's the kind of the short short version. It you know went on for two hours plus, I think. Uh, just okay. covering a whole broad range of of things about the COVID crisis, the mismanagement, uh, the decisions made, masking, lockdowns, pretty much covered it uh, and yeah. uh, pretty much got it right. It was very, you know, I was very in the moment and in the data. I'd been touring quite a bit already with other physicians. I knew what frontline docs were encountering that were treating patients. I knew about the ivermectin. I'd, I'd spent intensive work uh, with uh, under a contract with the Department of Defense to identify repurposed drugs, working with other physicians. And I was sitting in on the uh, active committee meetings on behalf of the DOD as a non-voting member. These are the committee meetings that uh, were overseeing the uh, basically uh, the NIH research into repurposed drugs and new drugs that was being funded through a backdoor mechanism of a nonprofit that had been created that allowed Pharma and Gates to shovel money into the NIH to do the stuff that they wanted them to do. Um, so I had all that stuff fresh on my mind. I knew all the latest ins and outs and, 
and uh, just had a good chat with Joe about uh, yeah. the way of the world. And you, yeah, and, many and of I, your commentary, you were saying earlier, a year later, January comes around and it gets quiet, but it, it started to yeah, so, come out to be so, true. Yeah, um, the, the, you know, it became increasingly clear that the government had grossly mismanaged this in every way and that the lockdowns actually caused more harm than they did any good at all, that the masks uh, were completely ineffective, of course. You know, they're, they're dust masks. If I'm sanding wood, that's the mask I would choose. But if I'm trying to protect <laughs> against a virus, not so much, uh, let alone the cloth masks. Um, so all the data on all these things had increasingly become common knowledge. And uh, the studies were finally starting to trickle through all of the censorship that was happening in academic journals. And, uh, um, and I expected that the government, you know, and there was, there was things popping up, like there's an article in the Atlantic Monthly that was just kind of a, can't we all get along and make happy here, that, in which they proposed a Truth and Reconciliation Commission akin to uh, South Africa after the collapse of apartheid which, uh, you know, landed with a thud. Uh, and um, uh, so there was some momentum suggesting that the, uh, you know, there's those, they call, it, call them the branch Covidians, uh, the COVID crisis uh, advocates for, for these heavy-handed authoritarian responses were starting to recognize the reality. And I expected that to be a turning point and we would, we would see a gradual uh, um, kind of uh, limited hangout, you know, the CIA strategy of just releasing a little bit of information that's true that everybody knows and then masking the rest and then gradually releasing a little bit more. I, I expected this is what was going to come down. And instead what came down was uh, this really heavy-handed doubling down on the denialism. Uh, Crazy. Together with more mandates, our legal challenges, you know, we had uh, the Twitter files, which if you want an interesting uh, journey through Wikipedia, uh, yeah. look at their revisionist history about the, the Twitter files. One of the things about Wikipedia is it's, it's heavily, heavily edited by both uh, U.S. and U.K. intelligence community operatives. Uh, so... Um, yeah, it, it's littered with misinformation right on Wikipedia. I think it, it will reference you as a as a uh, conspiracy theorist. I mean, it's just insane. Actually, despite mine, your... mine has gotten a little bit better lately. I don't know Great. why. Uh, it <laughs> used to be really wicked. Um, and I always show the clip from this uh, Canadian comedian uh, that goes by the name What's-Her-Face, who chronicles a lot of the early uh, uh, manipulation on my Wikipedia entry. But now it's, huh. it's, it's mostly true, that at least the first two-thirds of it, and then it ventures off into opinions. One of the, one of the mm -hmm. things that, and of course those are all defamatory, um, one of the things about Wikipedia is that they only consider mainstream media articles as true. So you have to build, uh, for, for any of these kinds of things, you have, one has to, if you're a Wikipedia editor, you have to rely on citations from the New York Times or uh, Washington Post or the Atlantic Monthly or whatever. And those are all, uh, you know, mockingbird sub subverted publications now. Uh, that's right. And so uh, that's, that's part of, the, it's, fun, it's amazing to watch how interlaced the media ecosystem is. Yeah. And of course it all comes under the Trusted News Initiative, which is the granddaddy of uh, trade unions in uh, based, uh, you know, uh, BBC is mo managing it. And it's it's the granddaddy of trade unions for corporate media that is basically set up to try to defend uh, the, uh, I think the best metaphor, you know, the, the book about uh, don't eat my, who ate my cheese, um, to yeah. defend the corporate media cheese from uh, these small pirates that keep biting ankles, uh, such as yourselves, uh, that represent alternative media. And um, when you look at their publications from, you know, their internal analyses and such uh, from TNI and from uh, some of their uh, trade union um, uh, think tanks, 
Uh, they all recognize the threat of alternative media, and that is embodied in Mr. Joe Rogan. Mr. Joe Rogan is, 100%. is their, uh, their particular version of Lucifer. Yeah. yeah. There's a few things that I know our, our audience is going to be dying to ask, and I'm just going to run through a, a yeah. quick maybe frame that you may want to add to, but Go for it. just some important thoughts that would be really important to get from you. Number one, the origins of COVID. Really interesting sort of to consider in an election year when China was on their knees, American infrastructure and the economy was roaring at a time when energy independence was at an all-time high here in America. Um, really, like, about as good an economy as you can get and a lot of build-up to that. Uh, no wars happening. Everything's really pretty start, peachy start keen. and fire on all cylinders. Yeah, so, so there's this origin concept that I'd love to talk to you about. I, from there, I want to. there's a lot of dots that, are gonna, that, that happen over the next few years that are important to really connect as we go forward there. How that uh, the mRNA vaccine got brought into existence, the story behind that vaccine, and then the controversy well, we around the vaccine. We could go for another two hours, it sounds like. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there... You know, a lot of people did get the vaccine, and there's probably a lot of people that were put put under, put under pressure. And and my second jab, I got cardiac damage and a lot of other symptoms that many. I didn't know that. Yeah, so I'm vaccine injured, and I'm continue to take beta blockers and have various treatments for that. Oh wow, that well, we just had a guest on, and he knew you were going to be on our show with us, and he's a big, big influencer in the world, one of the biggest in the world. And he said, hey, make sure you ask for the people that got vaccinated, they got duped into that, how they can help themselves. Is there anything they could be doing? So I promise we'd slip that question there, but I, so, I so presume we'll get there if we go in the timeline of order of thoughts. Yeah, but fire away. The whole what's your origin date and what is your origin event? Because that's the first thing we have to debate. Yeah, well, the big question that I'd love to just tee up for you is, is this a natural biological uh, uh, event or was this manufactured and what was the intent behind it? And was this released into the world on purpose? And, and your theory on why? I assume money, this will be theory, but I, with you, you're such a supported by science, in fact, human. That's why I love asking you this question. So so let's, let's dig into it. Uh, there is a theory of the case that the initial... Uh, I'm going to choose neutral language here. The initial emergence into the human population was at the military games uh, that were held in China. And uh, that puts the timeline more summertime. Uh, wow. There's, uh, that is more speculative, uh, but there's a lot of anecdotal around that. The uh, more hard uh, date that is well supported by the Lancet Commission and many other lines of investigation uh, suggests something in November, so fourth quarter of 2019. Uh, and, uh, and it appears, my, my, my preferred version of this, recognizing this is like alternative timelines you know, it just fragments. Yeah. It can go. It, there's so many different versions of this story. Sure. Uh, yeah. But the one that I think is the most credible personally, and this is in part based on the data uh, and evidence, and in part based on my understanding of uh, working with monkeys. I used to be a primate center research investigator at Davis. Okay. Uh, so... Um, Infection of laboratory technicians in non-human primate research facilities is a constant risk, uh, even in the best facilities. Um, and there's a simian herpes virus that's actually quite wicked uh, that, that is always a risk, uh, and many other viruses. Uh, in you know, working with monkeys in these primate facilities, small monkeys are nasty business no matter what. And they're even nastier when they're in cages. Uh, they throw feces, they bite, they spit. Um, they're just an angry, nasty piece of work, as you would be probably if you were stuck yeah. in a little cage where all you could do is jump back and forth on the <laughs> bars and turn, yeah. you know, and had to sit above your poop all day long. Uh, so, uh, but be that as it may, um, the risk of uh, technician infection in that environment is non-trivial in the best of situations. 
it appears that there is good documentation that at least two technical support personnel at the Wuhan Institute of Virology came down with an unusual upper respiratory infection that was quite severe around November-ish, and there was a pronounced response from uh, the CCP officials uh, to that that included uh, coming into the laboratory, destroying records, destroying virus samples, and uh, doing some engineering to change airflow, which is crucial. I mean, it, this seems like a little technicality. It's a little technicality that destroyed uh, the value of a huge building at the U.S. Army uh, Medical Research Facility in Fort Detrick, Maryland. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they built a big fancy building with uh, BSL-34 primate facilities and a huge atrium. And unfortunately, they could never get the air handling correct, which means that uh, you know if you don't have uh, reverse pressure in those uh, laboratory facilities, um, you can be blowing uh, whatever nasties are working in there out into the general, you know, out into the uh, the foyer. Um, so right, yeah. uh, not so good. Uh, um, you know, I'm hey, I'm here to sell you uh, um, laboratory equipment, and I walk away with the virus. Um, yeah. So uh, this is always a risk. It it the data appeared to have manifested that this risk manifested. However, that said, there is no way that I can rule out intentional release. And it's very curious that uh, all this happened in the beating industrial heart of China, Wuhan. Um, now, it also happened at a time when Wuhan was under uh, a, a literal cloud of pollution that was uh, non-trivial. And at the same time, Northern Italy was under a similar cloud of really intense industrial pollution. Uh, and that may have had something to do with the high case fatality rate in Northern Italy. That's, that was uh, the hypothesis back in January, February, March of 2020. Now the CIA set up a commission uh, to uh, determine uh, whether or not this was a laboratory Point origin, and uh, it's been revealed recently in uh, congressional testimony by a whistleblower from the CIA, who I happen to know, uh, who that this commission, there was an attempt to bribe it uh, by the mm -hmm. CIA, and uh, they surreptitiously brought Tony Fauci in to attempt to influence the commission and walked him through CIA uh, um, entry points uh, in a way so that he didn't have to be logged in as visiting the CIA. Uh, so uh, that, that got revealed. There was significant pressure put on this commi committee to draw the conclusion that this was a natural source, not a laboratory release, uh, which is like pretty much now Everybody says, well, that's the final smoking gun or the stake in the heart on that it issue. Is. Um, so, uh, you know, Because well, why else would you do that? Right, exactly. Um, you wouldn't. So, and then there, in parallel, uh, the Department of Energy, everybody, you know, why the Department of Energy? What dog do they have in this fight? DOE is, uh, they, they set up their own committee and commission, which came to the conclusion that it was laboratory origin. In the end, the CIA, this part of the CIA, concluded that it was laboratory origin of, uh, I think they called it um, low, low, low probability um, or intermediate probability. What that translated to was they, they were confident that it was laboratory origin, but they didn't have the documentation to support that. And so they couldn't say it was high probability. Uh, that it was of laboratory origin. It had to be inferred indirectly from other data and information. And uh, so if they had had the actual documents, but of course the Chinese destroyed those documents. Right. Uh, so, um, uh, so there clearly was, and then we have all of this information about how Jeremy Farrar and Tony Fauci and uh, I'm blanking yet again, the former director of the NIH, 
all, all colluded using uh, burner cell phones, literally, Jeremy Farr being the head literally. of the Welcome Trust, uh, to uh, discuss how they were going to respond to this. And we have emails that have come out. Uh, um, there's a, a virologist at uh, the Scripps Research Institute uh, that uh, initially wrote uh, that he was sure that this was laboratory origin and then flipped his narrative and uh, um, was an author on the paper published saying that it wasn't laboratory origin and then shortly thereafter got a major uh, grant award from Tony Fauci. It's just all these all these signs yeah. of corruption and collusion and cover-up uh, that have yeah. come out. So I'm pretty sure that uh, it's it didn't come from the Wuhan seafood market, uh, although that was the original yeah. title of the virus. I remember when I downloaded it in, in I think, January 10th or 11th, the sequence off the NIH servers, it was since deleted. But it was placed there as the Wuhan seafood market virus. That was the name that was given to the sequence. Oh, man. And uh, the Wuhan seafood market is actually a long ways uh, in Wuhan, away from a Wuhan Institute of Virology. So it's not like, you know, they just slip a dead monkey out the door and then go sell it on the seafood market. Um, uh, you know, or that kind of, that was part of the speculation is that, uh, yeah. they, you know, this protein starved Chinese, uh, rural peasants, uh, were, were dragging the trash cans, the dump, they were dumpster diving behind the Wuhan, uh, Institute of Virology to get old, um, carcasses. Yeah. Uh, and that was how this happened. That's, uh, that's bunk. Um, and yeah. you know, there was a uh, bat soup. I don't know if you remember bat soup and pangolins and turtles. Yeah. And yep. I remember all that. All that. Stuff. I, you <laughs> know, th th there was a lot of foreshadowing that, that there was going to be a, a pandemic. There was right. all sorts of footage that happened before from, from Fauci. And, and it and seemed event like event 201 is the smoking gun on this, uh, that was held at a, uh, basically a spook shop, a CIA spook shop at, uh, um, Johns Hopkins University and was funded uh, by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and brought together uh, personnel from the intelligence community, from media, from the WHO, from the Chinese government, uh, and many others to engage in pandemic planning for a hypothetical coronavirus release uh, that had a case fatality rate, as I recall, of 3.4%. Uh, and this mm -hmm. is another one of those, uh, you know, Mr. Bannon says there's no coincidences. Wow. Uh, yeah, and, think about this. And uh, that was the number that was actively promoted by the uh, <laughs> um, uh, the modeling group in uh, oh, London. Uh, London. Crazy. Uh, London, that, yeah. That it was 3.4% case fatality rate. And prior to that, uh, Mr. Trump had come out saying publicly that it was well less than 1%. 1%, And he yeah. was just ridiculed. He was raked over the coals yeah, rat. Right. And, and he was absolutely right. Now we know. He right, was dead on. It, precisely. He got the right number. So You, so, you couldn't make this up. It, this is too oh, perfect. Oh, no, you throw this something. out. This script, this script would be considered absurd. No. <laughs> yeah, and it, and, it, and it justifies the position that this was on purpose, that this was yeah. this was a pre-planned attack in an election year in, 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 a, in a really thriving U.S. economy. And you guys, for, for globalists, you got to think about how globalists think. I mean, when you, he, he keeps mentioning Bill. We all hear it. It's not just you, Dr. Malone. We hear Bill and, and, and Melinda Gates Foundation over and over in society. You hear it. You hear that name connected with farmland, with, with food, with, with so many big things. And here they are embedded so, in so many of the issues we're already talking about early in this, in this interview. Bring, you know, bringing this up. What is this connection that these guys seem to always have into these areas that are very, very controversial? Yeah, it's, uh, I saw a, um, a little meme the other day. Uh, we all grew up thinking the devil looks like this and, you know, red with horns and, and smoke and all <laughs> that stuff and cloven hooves. Um, but he really looks like this. It's a picture of Bill Gates in a sweater. Um, <laughs> The, the big question is why, like, you know, yeah. again, we're, we're still early in this conversation. I want to re kind of so connect the dots in sequence, I, but what, I, what's I, the point I, here? Um, that the, certainly one of the leading uh, conspiracy theories that have been floated 
is the depopulation agenda. And I have refused to go uh, there uh, interesting. until uh, a colleague friend of mine uh, who's, uh, you know, been a silent force behind, let's call it the resistance throughout this last three years, named Gavin DeBecker. He actually runs the security firm that's providing security for Bobby Kennedy, uh, among many other things. Oh, uh, so interesting. Gavin uh, did a deep dive, had found a document and did a deep dive into it called the Kissinger Report. Kissinger Report was developed under Dick Nixon and then uh, ratified as U.S. policy by Gerald Ford, and it remains U.S. policy to this day. And wow. you can find the links and the analysis on our Substack, stack, uh, but uh, it, it, that document is a mind blower. Uh, it, it specifically talks about, and this is another one of those odd coincidences. Uh, yeah, this is in the 1970s. Yeah, U.S. policy right? is to cap population growth at 8 billion. That is formal <laughs> U.S. policy. And we were at 7.8 billion at uh, January of 2020, and we've reach, reached over 8 billion globally now. Um, so that's, that's kind of coinc odd coincidence, number one. Uh, and in that report, there's a whole bunch of uh, fascinatingly shocking statements having to do with uh, population control policy, um, least developed nations, overt statements. I mean, this is hardcore real politic. Uh, or, you, you, know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's got Kissinger's thumbprints all over it. Uh, yeah. That... Uh, we should yeah. not allow the growth of uh, young male uh, populations in least developed countries, for instance, throughout yeah. Africa, because uh, obviously they're potential as war fighters and as social disruptors, because we want to be able to extract the mineral wealth out of these countries. And it's right there. It's in your face. Yeah, it says it in yeah, there. Yeah, it says it in there. Um, so... You're right. We, you, the likes of you and I go about our lives wondering how we're going to pay our mortgage and what car to buy next and uh, how to raise our kids and, and get them educated and the likes of that. And there is absolutely a cohort of individuals, and we could name you know, the Club of Rome and Bilderbergs and, and the WEF and all these, other, you know, the Council on National Pol uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Council on uh, Foreign Policy that... that uh, you know, most of the CNN broadcasters seem to belong to um, huh. that that all spend their time, you know, uh, as if uh, they're they're Doctor Evil, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, scheming uh, about the fate of the world, and uh, yeah. I and and no, they're not elected, uh, they're you know. Uh, but they somehow feel uh, empowered, I guess, by money. And this gets to this, you know, what we were saying at the start here about living in a postmodern world where truth is entirely subjective. Uh, yeah. they, they, this, this group, this, this cluster of highly influential people, which includes now the World Economics Forum, thousand largest corporations and their leaders and the trained young leaders uh, that you can find on our website at maloneinstitute.org, that spreadsheet that lists all the trained uh, young leaders. It's a five-year training program. Justin Trudeau is a notable member. Uh, Governors yeah. Inslee and Newsom are notable members. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they've all been trained uh, to think this way. I think they're selected, frankly, uh, yeah. as sociopaths. I think they're selected for narcissistic personality disorder and sociopathy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you from, are you familiar with, um, uh, rules for radicals? I don't, I'm making, a, I've heard, a, a, a I've stretch. heard, I've heard the title. I haven't read it. Yeah. So, book by Saul Linsky, but it, it's good. <coughs> right. it's how, how, how you, you strip freedom away yeah. and you do it from in, you don't need to fire a bullet. This, you can do it from within. Mr. Obama's mentor, right? Yeah, yeah, and and Hillary Clinton, like, you know, like you know, taught under him. Both of them did. It's really a doctrine of of uh, far beyond just socialism. Yeah. I mean, this is a, a, a communist manifesto. But 
COVID seemed to fast forward a lot of what that book teaches. It was already, they already got education, they got the media, they got pop culture in Hollywood, all these areas of influence and higher learning. You know, this was the way you destroy from within. It almost seemed like COVID really exacerbated their movement and it allowed them to really go for broke. One of the things that I felt just from a normal consumer looking in the marketplace and someone that actually had a fraud perpetrated against them during that elect last election cycle, where me and my wife voted in the state of Nevada, a, a state that I have not been registered to vote in for nearly 13 years. Um, and the only reason I knew about it is because two ballots were sent to our Idaho address from Nevada with our names on them. And I threw them away and I checked after the election. Somehow a vote had been cast in our name in Nevada. That's clear fraud. But it allowed, it allowed not only their agenda to move forward at a lightning speed, but it really allowed a fraud to take place, uh, the likes of which we've never seen, because it, it changed the rules for things that Americans used to trust at least to a certain degree. Now, you can't fully trust anything. We remember the, the hanging chad, you know, paper ballot days. Uh, but I'll tell you what, you wonder why Americans like us are so worried and are so c concerned for America. We watched this fraud happen, in, so, literally in my case, in front of my face. So uh, this is another aspect of what I lecture on when I talk about Psy War and sovereignty. This is the core of that. Um, hmm. And I argue, and you can find the video from the hit that I just did uh, with Shannon Joy's rally, uh, um, readily available. My argument is that when a nation state and its government is willing to deploy modern Psy War technology on its own citizens, that the concept of personal sovereignty and autonomy becomes completely obsolete. It's gone. Um, and uh, the nuance of this electronic ballot or that hanging chad is noise compared to uh, the power of a, of a government to control all information that you encounter and everything that you think, feel, and believe. Because that's what this technology wow. does. And w once, once they cross the Rubicon and they, yeah. they come to the decision that it's acceptable to preserve democracy, as Obama said, right, at his Stanford speech. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah the, right? the means justify the ends. It yeah. is absolutely utilitarian. It's utilitarianism yeah. Yeah. on steroids with uh, an extra it helping is. of uh, electronic information control. And now, as I said, in, in, as we head into this election with deep fakes, there's, there is no reality. The only reality will be that of those Scary. that are most heavily financed and able to gain access to uh, media. And this appears to be uh, something that the, whatever we want to call it, administrative state, deep state, the Leviathan, we've got a lot of different words for it, um, has convinced themselves is necessary to perform, uh, acceptable to perform, because they believe they're facing an existential crisis. They, I, I'm, I'm sure, and I hear this again and again, the administrative state believes that the likes of us, um, with our little pea shooters, our little David to their Goliath, um, is uh, a true existential threat, meaning a true threat to their survival. And uh, in the, and that Mr. Trump's greatest sin was that he was damaging the government. Yeah. And uh, that in the face of this existential crisis, anything goes. They are, they are justified yeah. to do anything they want. Yeah, there's Wild. the, there's the uh, distorted ethics of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, he was screwing. He was screwing up their game plan. He, you know, this whole idea of drain the swamp. That's exactly who he was talking about. Was the people that were were doing harm to freedom. He was going, and it must have been a very hard game for Mr. Trump to be able to go in there and sort out who's doing good and who's doing well, bad. He couldn't. But, okay, that that's the other thing. That's so. This there's a. This is more inside baseball. If you haven't followed, and there's another one you can find on our Substack and in the book. Uh, Lies my government told me. Uh, what Trump, Trump discovered uh, was that as a executive, uh, whatever you think of him in his style, let's say, uh, in, 
and uh, whether or not he was more a broadcaster than he was an executive. He certainly was coming from the tradition of uh, the rather unilateral, uh, empowered uh, U.S. executive that had the power to hire and fire in order to uh, ensure uh, that uh, his organization would be responsible uh, to his and responsive to his direction. And he right. walked into D.C. and hit a brick wall because that's not the, the administrative state literally again and again and again um, would take his directives I mean, kind of process this. There's multiple examples of this. They would take his presidential directives about what to do and then at the next level down would subvert those and would issue those as internal administrative directives in ways that would be orthogonal and completely different from what Trump had said that needed to be done. And then everybody downstream would follow the administrators. This, this is the logic that uh, we hear now increasingly that uh, these administrators are the government. They are the permanent employees of the government. And exactly. the elected officials are the temporary employees of the government. And right. So what Mr. Trump did was he said, hmm, what can I do about that? And he, I'm sure he had a powwow with his buddies. And uh, what they came up with is this thing called Schedule F. Because if you want to hire, if you want to fire, I'm sorry, somebody from one of the higher ranks in the government service uh, corps, or this, let alone the senior executive service, these uh, highly privileged uh, government managers that have their own flag, uh, um, that really yeah. run the government, the SES does. Uh, if you want to fire these folks, it takes you about two years of administrative battles and legal battles to get there. Okay, so right. I don't like you. You've you've directly contramanded my orders. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, I've got two as as an executive. You've got two options. You can take that person and put them in a coat closet, uh, and you know, not and take away their portfolio. At which point they'll go and complain to the Washington Post or the L.A. Times, like Rick Bright did, or you can try to fire them. And uh, it takes two years to fire them. And so he he put through this clever little thing. He was going to create a whole new parallel track for. Uh, government employees for these more senior government employees and called Schedule F. And uh, he would reassign them from where they are over to Schedule F. And then the, the rules and regulations for Schedule F would then allow him to fire them. So they could just move them laterally into Schedule F. Everybody's going to get reclassified. And then they're going to be basically at will employees like the likes of most of us. And uh, that took enormous court battles to get through, and it basically just got through right when the elections hit. And literally the first thing that Mr. Biden did when he got in, being the good uh, you know, minion of the administrative state that he is, is yeah. he, he canceled, he terminated <laughs> executive orders for uh, Schedule F, which is pretty clear example that that was seen as a threat. Uh, so that's, amazing. So that's that, and I I still think that this is this is another one of those things like the Abraham Accords and yes. the withdrawal from the WHO. That as we look back, we go, we all, you know, he, this guy took a lot of heavy flack, but and yeah, he did a lot of mean tweeting, uh, and he was right. And he may not be the guy that I'd want to go to dinner with necessarily, or or have uh, my daughter marry, uh, but. By God, he did a lot of good stuff. Yeah. He did. He, he was a Brahma bull, and he, he, he treated government like business. And that's I don't think he realized the, the, when he got into office the match that he was up against yeah. with these people, these that. deep-stated people. Well, I, he had no I'm, concept of I'm it. I'm pretty sure what happened was uh, um, he woke up that morning and basically said, oh, shit, now I'm president. What am I going to do? Uh, and they hadn't invested. this. this um, if you talk to the uh, insiders that were there in the campaign and then in the initial phases of the administration, what you hear is uh, we didn't have depth at the bench uh, for a hiring. And so they scrambled. And they ended up with a lot of people that were really pretty much deep state insiders. Alex Azar is a great example yeah. of that uh, hmm. at HHS. Yeah. And uh, so 
out of out of kind of desperation, they cast about and you know, oh, who do you know? Oh, I think this person's a good one. Um, and uh, that's that's how Debbie Burks and uh, um, yeah. uh, the Bob uh, not Gallo um, Bob Redford uh, got yeah. put into head of CDC is basically there is a wealthy couple that are involved in philanthropy in Africa, I think Samaritan's Purse, and were involved in the president's emergency plan for AIDS uh, in Africa. And uh, they were uh, um, fundamental, uh, you know, born again, and very much in with Mr. Pence. And uh, they turned to them, among others, for advice and uh, they knew about Burks and Redford, and that was that was certainly Bob uh, Redfield. I mean, Bob Redfield got into yeah. that pathway uh, because they were well known to that couple, and that seems to kind of have been how things worked uh, early on. Amazing. It was a scramble of oh yeah. shit, who can we yeah. pull in to fill the chairs? All these enemies from within, everywhere yeah. you look. Yeah. What a re- this whole thing. If you knew, if you really knew the real truth of what a racket this whole thing is and what a, like just all the scandal and all the deep stated, I mean, this is powerful stuff, but you know, that, that, that whole COVID pandemic, that might've been literally like, all right, let's press the button and go knowing they knew it was going to happen. They were waiting for the right well, moment to deploy it. And this, yeah, there's the whole economic angle. I mean, this, you cannot uh, <laughs> overcome the fact that this was the largest upward transfer of wealth in modern history. Oh, God. Um, exactly. And think about you it. You can't overcome uh, the debanking in uh, Canada and what that's led okay. to. You, that the uh, Bank of International Settlements and the World Economic Forum say overtly that uh, this was intended to be a wedge to drive uh, central bank digital currency and associated uh, oh, that's a uh, social credit topic. system. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All these agendas, and, and I used to think, I remember back in the day, people would say the Great Reset, and I was just like, oh, God, that's another damn conspiracy theorist. Um, what happened? And, <laughs> and then, yeah. and then uh, Jill and I read the book, The Great Reset, uh, by Klaus Schwab. And uh, then the great narrative, and we were just, you know, and, and then we learned that the current king of England was the one that first announced uh, the Great Reset. It wasn't a reset. Bomb. So uh, that that was a kind of an eye-opening moment. Yeah. Well, wanna, you know, someone was this weekend, I, I, I just had an exchange with Robert Kennedy Jr. on this Saturday night, and he mentioned, he said his theory on COVID is that they now have this big experiment under their belt. They've learned all the lessons of it. They see what we can do. And he called it, uh, I think, totalitarian, on-demand totalitarianism, where they can literally play this game now and dial up the uh, some some disease or pandemics coming up, and they can kind of use it accordingly now. And they can essentially use this for all of time going forward. So uh, the U.S., intelligence community and the military have a long history of piloting programs and capabilities like this. Uh, hmm. And Arab Spring was a pilot for uh, using Twitter as a weapon. And hmm. uh, that's another thing I lecture about. And, and I first learned that this is the case uh, from my dad, uh, who was an wow. electrical engineer, it came out of Stanford, uh, he was originally in Navy intelligence stationed in Okinawa. And then, uh, so he came out of Stanford and his first job was with Hiller Aircraft. Uh, in other words, the people who build the Hueys and uh, um, helicopters. And uh, he, he, when he joined the firm, he was told that there's going to be a major conflict in Southeast Asia that is going to be used to pioneer and develop uh, rotary wing aircraft-based warfare, which is why he should work for Hiller, of course, is because Hiller is going to be at the front of this uh, new technology. And uh, so I think there's a lot of merit to, uh, certainly it's long been the practice of uh, um, military and intelligence community to use these skirmishes uh, as a as a kind of a test bed for advancing uh, various warfare technology. The uh, I'd love to swing back if you guys don't mind to that COVID question uh, 
we didn't hear fully answered that our earlier guest asked us to ask you, Dr. Malone, which is... Well, we haven't even got to vaccine problems yet. You should yeah, get yeah. to the vaccine problem and mRNA before yeah, you yeah. sort of sum up, like, how, how can people... Yeah, ask that. Yeah. Well, yeah. well let's, but, let's hit the drugs since, since you've asked it. Um, and for sure, here, for sure. my position on this is that I don't provide uh, drug advice. Uh, I'm a, yeah. I don't practice as a physician. Uh, I, I am medically licensed, but I use that for clinical, or I used to use it for clinical research and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, so, but I was the, one of the first to advocate for the use of natokinase. And as an individual, I have uh, had both long COVID and post-vaccination syndrome. And uh, my, I, I have been successfully treated using a modified version of the FLCCC uh, I recover protocol. Uh, so that's readily found on the web. Uh, that would be Paul Merrick and here Corey's uh, nonprofit. They don't make profit off of that. There are, uh, I'm gonna hold my tongue here and, and just say in general, uh, there is a company that is marketing uh, ostensible formulations that will uh, allow you to recover of various nutraceuticals and other drugs uh, in over-the-counter stuff. Uh, and uh, say it this way, uh, a number of individuals with post-vaccination syndrome and long COVID are complaining now that they're getting charged large amounts of money for a preparation that is not providing the benefits. And uh, certain assertions have been made about these combinations of drugs and formulations that they are therapeutic and they will remove spike from your body is one such phrase. And uh, that's not, there's, that's not demonstrated uh, in, in, uh, with clinical research, it's not backed with actual data. That's more of a yeah. hope. And uh, those, those that make such claims are at very high risk uh, for FDA uh, audit and, um, and reaction. Uh, I, I, as we headed into the COVID crisis in 2020, I was just finishing and never did finish board certification in, in medical communications, which is a specialty area that would have been useful for my business back then. And that's why I abandoned it yeah. because uh, that business is gone. Uh, and it, it's, it teaches a lot of what the rules and regulations are for how you can communicate about drugs and drug activity mm -hmm. and, and the rules that the pharma has to follow, et cetera. So, it's, it's not okay uh, to make statements about therapeutic benefits unless you can prove them. So that's, yeah. that's the problem in this space is there are uh, pop-up uh, entrepreneur activities that are asserting that this is therapeutic or that's a therapeutic. And as far as getting the vaccine out of your body? Yeah, and the spike. If you, I mean, or yeah, the, the protein during, during that caused the, spike, the problem? Yeah. So what well, I, I'll just what say, I what, say what I, is the FLCCC protocol that's all based on uh, currently licensed drugs, uh, one of which is ivermectin, uh, in my case, was uh, very helpful. And uh, I did uh, recover most of my function. Uh, like I said, I'm still on beta blockers. Uh, but... I've been able to drop those way back because I also lost a lot of weight. One of the big problems here is folks that have a high body mass index and pre-diabetic conditions. And I had all that. I had high inflammatory markers and hemoglobin A1C. And uh, when I dropped from over 190 to now my kind of mid to low 160s, all of those enzyme markers leveled out. Resolved, yeah. Um, yeah. So... Uh, I think my ad the advice that I'm comfortable giving to people is certainly consider the FLCCC protocol, find a physician that's experienced in it because there's a lot of kind of knobs that you can twist in that uh, to up this or reduce that. Uh, and there's some things that you can add on to it. And, uh, and absolutely uh, eat healthy, uh, get more exercise, Get your vitamin D levels up. I just learned the other day from a uh, 
expert that knew more than I did about vitamin D that the data, there are data out there that we don't produce vitamin D3, the active version that you need, uh, after about age 34, even if you lie out in the sun, uh, you know, mm -hmm. buck naked. Uh, so uh, it, and if you, there are many physicians, hospitalists in particular, who will not draw a vitamin D level for you. So you gotta find somebody mm -hmm. who's willing to do that and uh, you need to titrate your vitamin D based on your own body mass and, you know, how much sunshine you're getting yeah. and all that good stuff. Uh, but absolutely, vitamin D, zinc, there's other supplements that will, uh, you know, bona fide uh, are associated in the literature, peer-reviewed literature, with increased resistance against a wide range of respiratory viruses. Remember, COVID now is increasingly like the common cold, like a beta coronavirus is. Yeah, bizarre. And then, well, it's not bizarre to me. I'm a virologist. I always predicted this is what's going to happen. Um, uh, that's the history. That's the trajectory of viruses when they enter a new host population. Is they tend to be super pathogenic at the start, and then over time they become more infectious and less pathogenic. Uh, that has to do with the evolutionary pressure on viruses, and that's always the case. Uh, yeah. So, um, so that's what's happened here. And, uh, but there's a lot of respiratory, there's flu A, flu B, RSV, uh, rotavirus. Uh, there's just a whole lot of uh, rhinovirus stuff out there. And uh, many of these things uh, can, like vitamin D with zinc and others, yeah. uh, give you a lot better immunity across the board. And by the way, may also have some benefits for cancer. Uh, and now there's some data suggesting that ivermectin has therapeutic benefits and prophylactic benefits in cancer. Uh, so uh, interesting times. And then in terms of the adverse events, uh, huge list. Uh, we have a uh, uh, bibliography that we've compiled for academics and others uh, and for expert witness work that, uh, so it's all it's all tabbed and linked in ways that make it easy to cite things for a paper just by clicking if you use the right software. Uh, and that's about 1,200 references. Uh, Mark Trozzi has about 2,000 references uh, that are uh, curated but not linked in the same way. Uh, when we print it out as a PDF, it's about 500 pages because we open it up so you can see each of the abstracts. And I, I wow. gave that out um, in the talk that I gave in Pittsburgh uh, a couple days ago to participants. Uh, so it, it, it resolves into a number of different categories. Uh, um, you know, the big, big ones are uh, non-hemorrhagic stroke and other uh, uh, blood clotting disorders, uh, a variety of autoimmune diseases, and many physicians are increasingly uh, concerned about the wave of variety of autoimmune diseases that seem to be associated with this. Uh, that like, You're talking about the vaccine, right? I'm talking about the vaccine. Clarity. Yeah, talking about the vaccine. Yeah. Um, and uh, the one, you know, there's two that are officially accepted. No, well, really three. Uh, there is the uh, um, reproductive uh, dysmenorrhea, so alteration in menstruation. Is there a birth rate that's down attached? I want to. The birth rate is more complicated. Uh, there's confounding factors there, and uh, it varies depending on nation state. So that signal is less clear cut. But there are certainly obstetricians that are and patients that are reporting, uh, um, let's say, serial spontaneous abortions that uh, were not a problem before, hmm. but. Uh, that's, that's not as well documented. The uh, alteration in menstruation is really clear cut. You know, that's a finding that women keep track of. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and I can tell you the Orthodox Jews in uh, New York keep track of it, which is why they picked that signal up very, very early. Uh, and I testified with that and they, they came out with a rabbinical court determination that their people shall not take these vaccines because of the hmm. reproductive risks. Uh, but hmm. well, they're still pushing it though, despite all this? Well, New York State is and, and many other places are, but the- uh, um, Well, the drug Jewish, companies are. Oh, the drug, for, well, that's, that's a given. Um, 
and, and yeah, but I, uh, yeah. So so the uptake. This is another fun little propaganda uh, tip. Uh, you remember the quote survey that came out that fifty uh, percent of the population were eagerly awaiting the availability of the jab, uh, the boosters. Yeah. And uh, then about a month rolls around and uh, we get the bad news. Well, we only have 2% uptake. And suddenly Moderna, Pfizer, and BioNTech start stocks just go um, uh, 2%. Yeah, so, so um, not a lot of uptake. And, and with prior boosters, the uptake was uh, very low double digits, well below 20%. And likewise, the uptake in, for the primary series in young children was extremely low. So all those are kind of indicators of wins uh, for those of us that are trying yeah. to be beat the drum and say, hey, guys, uh, be careful here. Uh, so yeah, well, I, I, the, one that's, the one that's really egregious and well-documented is the myocarditis. And yeah. uh, that, that has, there's been a whole cluster of propaganda around that uh, that... Uh, the myocarditis is mild and transient. That's a lie, uh, in that it it doesn't have particularly serious consequences. That's a lie, uh, and the CDC asserts that the myocarditis is rare. But the problem with rare is that's not a quantitative number. Uh, I don't recall rare as something that you can divide by three. Um, yeah. uh, so rare is in the eye of the beholder. And uh, the incidence for clinical myocarditis in young males, this includes young adult males, like military personnel, uh, is something in the range of between one in a thousand, one in two thousand, in most studies. Now, not you know, uh, non-clinical myocarditis, in other words, signals such as release of specific myocardial enzymes like cardiac troponin, may be up to fifty percent. But clinical myocarditis is something that has long been recognized. It's usually associated with, you know, infectious disease-associated clinical myocarditis, mostly associated with some viral syndromes and some bacterial syndromes, but mostly viral. And uh, so we have a history of this more rare syndrome, uh, clinical viral myocarditis, for instance. And we know about its five-year mortality rate or case fatality rate. Um, and it seems to be the closest thing to what we're seeing with the vaccine myocarditis. And it's tracking like that, the clinical myocarditis from vaccines. And that has a five-year mortality rate of something between 10 and 15%. No so if you're, if you're Rochelle Walensky, uh, you can credibly say, well, uh, this is a rare adverse event. Well, if one in a thousand is a rare adverse event to you, then so be it. But uh, from my standpoint and that of most parents, uh, that's not a trivial number. Uh, and then if it's really one in 50 that are coming up with cardiac damage that's sufficient to release the enzymes and get a positive signal, well, what does that mean? We don't really know because we don't have enough time. But what we do know is now well documented because of Freedom of Information Act uh, findings is that the government knew this uh, in 2021, basically mid 2021, and they hid it. Uh, and they hid it for a very long time. They also hid the, another one that's an accepted adverse event, which is the reactivation of latent DNA viruses like Epstein Barr virus uh, and okay. shingles. So that's, that's another one, but they absolutely hid the myocarditis signal, apparently under the logic that uh, whether, whether or not true, anything that would cause somebody to become, quote, vaccine hesitant, um, in other words, have real informed consent, uh, was to be suppressed. So yeah. just because it was true that there was this myocarditis signal and there was damage being done to young adult males including military personnel and SEALs, et cetera, special force people. Uh, and, you know, the kid dying in the soccer field and those kinds of things and the, and the football player, uh, you know, athlete. Because uh, when, you're, when you're in a high-performance sport, you get surges of adrenaline and also s testosterone levels are up. And that seems to be a trigger for some of these sudden deaths, which could be myocardial, myocardial infarction, 
It could be uh, the aberrant electrical ry rhythms called circus rhythms that are associated with cardiac scars. And it could be stroke. Um, it could be acute blockage because these uh, products, anything that causes high level of circulating spike, including Novavax, uh, will yeah. uh, trigger uh, these blood clotting anomalies, among many others. Yeah, so all this data that's coming out, it's actual real data. Um, there's, there's, there's no correction from these authoritative states, no correction from big pharma, these pharmaceutical companies that are producing this stuff. There's no sort of redaction or, 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 or credit towards this information, number one. And they're continuing to, to, to push it. My big, big question, I try to ask like practical questions that the average viewer doesn't go over their head, that they just understand. So let me ask you a practical question that anyone understand that'll probably tell you the true nature of, the, of this vaccine. These, these executives in these, in these pharmaceutical companies, would they give this vaccine to themselves or their kids? So uh, I think it's Borla at Pfizer is on record for saying no. Um, <laughs> well, there you go, period. <laughs> and I know if they're not taking the only medicine they're prescribing, then that's a problem. Or developing in their case. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, and then there's all the speculation about, you know, the observation that the mandates didn't apply to Congress critters. Yeah, bizarre. Uh, like, people are idiots. <laughs> I gotta, like, yeah, you, I saw well, that from a mile so, away, and I'm like, hold on, wait a minute. We were we were talking about Matthias Desmond a little bit in the mass formation frustrating uh, hypothesis. Um, Matthias, it was pointed out to me somebody by somebody the other day that uh, Matthias emphasizes the nature of the word totalitarianism. Hmm. Okay, totalitarianism as opposed to authoritarianism. Authoritarianism involves a subset of society imposing their will on the rest. In totalitarianism, the entire society goes barking mad, as I said on, on uh, Rogan. And right. uh, we pretty much had that with the you know minority exception of the likes of uh, the three of us, I guess, and uh, many of our listeners. And it's hard to remember that we're in a bubble. Uh, we're sur typically surrounded by people of like minds, unless you're out uh, encountering customers, retail, or, or in some way moving about or live in San Francisco or L.A. Uh, you, or New York City. You don't, you don't encounter people of diverse points of view. You tend to be around people that are more like you. And so we think that uh, most people are... are waking up, quote unquote, or aware of these yeah. things that we're all discussing. But as we head into a deeper and deeper state of totalitarianism, it envelops the entire culture with, mm. with the possible exception of the, you know, 20 percent that are resistant to a hypnosis and with buried within those are the five, three to five percent who are true warriors. Uh, mm. Yeah. And this is as old as that classic book, uh, Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Yep. I think it was written. Yep. Madness of Crowds, and really goes all the way back to Plato's uh, um, Allegory of the Cave. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's the basis yeah. for the Allegory of the Cave. Uh, most people would rather yeah. look at the shadows, and they will reject you if you come back into the cave and say, no, those are just shadows, uh, yeah. you know, and you're being fooled. I just uh, was with you this week, and I saw uh, at the Ahern uh, the unseen crisis. I, I thought it was a premiere, but it's, I, I guess it's been out for some time. But it's the first time I'd seen that documentary, um, giving a voice to the vaccine injured. It, it was really telling. It was really profound. And I know there's the, the, the data has even changed even more um, since that's been released. That you mentioned that you know it's a, this is this is evolving fast. But that was really profound to see the effect that this has had on so many people, but no media coverage, no lawsuits. I mean, that's the other thing. You can't go after these drug companies for this because of some like rule written in okay. that you can't go after vaccine. Well, makers. there's so yes, uh, that's true. But there's been a recent break on that. Oh, and uh, this is Steve Kirsch is just lighting up the uh, Twitter space about this, and many others are jumping on it. Jessica Rose is another one. I put out a Substack about it today. 
So uh, in Werner Mendenhall, who's been uh, one of the lead attorneys behind many of these cases, uh, concurs that uh, this is a major break. And uh, the thing is that all of those terms and conditions that have protected Pfizer and Moderna and BioNTech, et cetera, uh, are all predicated on the thesis that fraud has not occurred. If fraud occurs, then all of that contract language is voided. Huh. And huh. so all of us have been like, where's the fraud? Where's the fraud? You know, and, and um, there was a case uh, brought by one of those uh, women that were uh, in that video, I think Bree Dressen. Oh, that's right. Uh, and uh, um, she brought the case based on what she'd observed at Ventavia. And uh, in the end, that was thrown out. And uh, Pfizer made the successful argument that uh, basically their legal position was we didn't commit fraud. We delivered the fraud that the government ordered. And That's crazy. The backstory to that with all the, all the nuance about government contracting, but that is essentially the position that uh, won the day with the judge. Uh, that that because the government had gone ahead and paid the invoices and Pfizer had revealed these various documents over time, you know, the government apparently wasn't paying attention. It wasn't following the bouncing ball very well. But uh, Pfizer did provide them with the documentation and they did go ahead and pay the invoices. And so then uh, the legal case was made that uh, we told the, Mr. Government what we were doing and what we were finding, and Mr. Government uh, said, that's fine, let's go ahead. And uh, so therefore it absolves Pfizer of responsibility. Now here's what's happened recently, hmm. is that well, bizarre. there's some uh, hardcore, uh, let's call them sequence analysts uh, working in laboratory environments that have uh, done a deep dive you know, I remember when the data, when they first found this after one vial, and I said, okay, guys, you better damn well get this right, because if what you found is real, yeah. there's going to be a shitstorm. Uh, and what they had reported when they did uh, basically deep sequencing and recovery, reassembly of DNA fragments found in these uh, RNA vaccine samples. So they found a lot of DNA fragments they sequenced them, they reassembled them into the plasmid using standard sequencing software, the circular DNA, RNA, DNA that's used to produce the RNA. And they found that the plasmid DNA that was being used as a template for providing, producing these RNA vaccines is uh, still present as DNA fragments at very high concentrations, it should be gone, uh, and that it is not as advertised uh, in other words, they were using a different DNA than they told the government they were using. And furthermore, that it contains sequences from a virus called simian virus 40, which is associated with cancer. It's the one that was a, the contaminant in the polio vaccines that since then there was a huge effort to, to sort out and it was proven that SV40 contamination in the early polio vaccines was associated with the development of uh, solid tumors called sarcomas in humans. And so to find SV40 sequences in these, in the DNA contamination that shouldn't be there, uh, was uh, when I first heard about this, when they came to me after they'd done it, I, I was just like, holy moly, uh, I, you know, you yeah. better make sure you got this right because you're going to be put on a spit and roasted good hard um, if you didn't. And so they went and uh, collaborated with another lab in Canada, and they got a bunch of samples of Moderna and Pfizer and uh, analyzed those and then have put that out as a preprint as it's in review. So they alerted the community through the preprint server. And uh, that, those data are so compelling that uh, they can't, I don't think they're gonna be overturned. And then since then, there's been disclosures at uh, Canada and Australia also, I think, that are verifying that this is the case, um, that Pfizer did right. not disclose this, that for some reason, I suggest willful blindness, uh, the regulatory authorities around the world never tested or discovered this, and that's fraud. 
That is called adulteration. That is fraud. It's it's a technical term, adulteration. It's the speci- one of the specific things that the FDA is tasked with uh, preventing by federal law. Um, and I just put this out on a sub stack with the you know citing the specific federal law uh, statutes, sections, wording, and the FDA. Uh, um, determination of what to, what's to be done when there is adulteration and that pathway and who has to file it and blah de blah de blah and um, as I had asserted when I first heard about this the standard because I am well trained in regulatory affairs and I said the standard thing if this adulteration is real which it is uh, is that uh, the product would be immediately withdrawn from the market yeah and uh, so that's, I documented that that in fact is the case and uh, um, what, the, what the regulations are on that and what the pathway is and who has to authorize it and all that stuff. Um, and uh, then, and Steve Kirsch picked up on this and got a quote out of me that he put up on Twitter yesterday that went uh, nuclear. And then he interviewed the scientists involved and Byron Bridle, who's uh, from University of Guelph, which is where one of these sequencing labs was and uh that's gone viral and right and then he yeah. spoke to Werner Mendenhall who's one of the top attorneys in this area he said yep that'll do it uh now that breaks the veil uh we have evidence of fraud and now we can go at him so that's where that stands and that's a huge new wow. development since the film was put out will that wow. lift the immunity from all drug companies or just Pfizer well, it's Pfizer and Moderna, uh, and by Pfizer, that extends back to BioNTech. And no, it's just about these uh, products. Companies. These particular, products, these okay. particular products. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, yeah. the... Incredible. And there's... What about the... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it's just this, n- another thought. Maybe I should let you finish first, though. But uh, just as it pertains to the emergency use authorization, didn't they find out that... That also was built on like essentially fraudulent information or incorrect information, to say the least, so that it should have never been actually I, pushed through I with emergency that's use the authorization. Case, and many do also. And actually, that was my sin that got me kicked off of Twitter was retweeting a slide deck from uh, the Canadian COVID Care Alliance that had a really clear. Um, you know, easily understood by the layperson explanation for that. And since then, there's been more fraud uncovered. Uh, as the film lays out, uh, there was exclusion of subjects uh, from the analysis. Uh, hmm. if, if they developed... So in, at the time of the clinical trials, to try to simplify this, at the time of the clinical trials, they were relying on... You had to have the symptoms... And you had to have PCR confirmation. You'll recall this from the film. And uh, the PCR tests were uh, um, basically junk back then. And uh, notoriously prone to false negatives. In other words, you really had COVID, but they would score you as negative. Mm -hmm. (coughs) And so there were a number of people in the trials that developed uh, symptoms of COVID on both the control arm and the treated arm. Uh, and uh, they, the decision was made by Ventavia and Pfizer that if, and it was written to the protocol, if you had a negative PCR, even though if you have symptoms, what they would do is throw you out of the trial. They would exclude you from the analysis. Uh, and if you went back, because we now know how crummy the PCR test was, if you went back and said, okay, let's add back in all the people that developed the clinical signs and symptoms of COVID and put them in the analysis and rerun the analysis, and if you do that, the efficacy in the clinical trial goes down to about 30% as opposed to 95 or 97%, yeah. okay? A complete fraud right there. And then the other one that's been fraudulent, that's come out more recently, is that there were a number of cardiac events, and they were excluded from the analysis also. And if you had factored those in, then you would have yeah. known uh, early on that uh, there was significant myocarditis risks. Yeah. Yeah. 
the, the whole thing, literally, when you, every single piece of this, it was littered with misinformation and fraud. And if you spoke out against it, they ridiculed you. They canceled you. They Twittered, put up little banners, and Facebook and Instagram would say, oh, misinformation, false, and, and, this is a lie. And YouTube would deplatform you, and Facebook yeah. was the most wicked of all. How, uh, it was. How is, yeah, go ahead. How is this... Like I'm, I'm really curious. Like I'm standing back, looking at your personal life, and how how these last two and a half, three years have been just like I, I would imagine, um, epically transformative for you. Like, yeah, that's one way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just so many. I was just talking to two physicians uh, in, a, in a private group I'm in, and they just admire the hell out of you. Oh, thanks. Uh, and and how would you speak to? How has it changed and what's on the horizon for you? Because we opened the show before we went on air. I mean, you're flying all over the world giving talks. How has this like impacted you, the man, and what you're focused on in life? So that's a good question. Um, sometimes we get there and when I'm giving talks, and we did in one of the sessions in Pittsburgh. Uh, hmm. um, so the personal impact. Number one, uh, I have to give a shout out to my wife, Dr. Jill Glasspool Malone. She's awesome. Of, of 40, she writes uh, a large fraction of the Substacks, always the Friday Funnies and the Sunday Strip. She's the primary author on. I just edit them. Uh, and um, so, uh, in a strange way, uh, this has been a huge growth opportunity for her. She's always been shy, hasn't wanted to be on camera or, or out in front or talking to pop to audiences. And uh, she's always, she has got a really sharp mind, very good at, at picking out issues and, and um, uh, nuances of things and topics. Uh, but her writing has not been that good. She's dyslexic. And uh, this has forced her to become really quite a good writer. And uh, because there's been a hue and cry for more female voices, she's found herself on stage from time to time or in podcasts, and she's gradually uh, gotten a lot more confidence. So it's been a huge, uh, um, really, uh, self-actualization uh, uh, process for, for Jill. Uh, it's destroyed our consulting business because basically I've uh, um, outed my industry. Uh, in yeah. many ways, and some of my specific colleagues, uh, I've I've uh, discussed uh, three different CIA agents uh, that uh, normally one would not discuss, uh, but uh, I've done so, uh, and that, that makes it odd why people think I'm a deep stater, uh, you know, CIA guy, uh, because I guarantee if I was, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, um, so destroy the. Uh, business that we built over decades. Uh, uh, shout out to Steve Kirsch, who uh, told me about Substack. Uh, and that was after the uh, Brett Weinstein, but before uh, Rogan. And uh, he said, Robert, I made $30,000 on Substack last month. You've got to get on this. And before that, I was just scratching along uh, you know, the occasional speaker's fee. Uh, oh, please, would you play, pay my airfare? Um, and a couple of donors dropped uh, some money that kept us afloat. And then uh, Rogan came on at the same time I was deplatformed from LinkedIn and Twitter, and a bunch of people rushed over on the Substack, so started subscribing. And uh, our Substack, we're now one of the top uh, Substack authors. And that, oh, fantastic. that generates uh, a non-trivial amount of revenue. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, sure. Um, uh, you deserve we it. Couldn't, yeah. We couldn't capitalize on YouTube or whatever because, you know, monetize on that because... Uh, they screw you. Yeah, well, and they'll boot us off just like they did with Brett. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, and, and it really hammered our horse business because that's always been based on Facebook and I became persona non grata. The name Robert Malone on Facebook is like death. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so that made it harder to sell horses. Uh, but um, it has uh, been a 
personal growth opportunity, enormous challenges. Psychologically, mm-hmm. it has been really fairly tough. Uh, and, I, yeah. and I really, so what I, my general answer to this question is uh, when people say, Robert, they've, they've hammered you so hard. Um, at first, when these things came out, like Atlantic Monthly's hit piece, I was just like, that's so unfair. Um, I, you know, I, and, and I'd, I'd whine and bitch about it and talk to other podcasters mm-hmm. and we'd all whine and bitch about it. And we do podcasts whining and bitching um, a little bit uh, and making fun of the author of that. Uh, um, and then, then, you know, Business Insider, Rolling Stone, um, Mother Jones, uh, you know, just goes uh, New York Times, Washington Post, of course, uh, and all of that. And at some point, you kind of just get over it. Uh, the one that was really hard was when I started getting attacked from the people that I thought were in the battle with me, were in the trenches with me. Uh, hmm. And that, that one hurt a lot, uh, and it still does a little bit. Uh, and because that's, you know, that's your brother's in arms. That's, that's fragging, okay? Um, the, the Vietnam term of, killing uh, um, higher rank officers with grenades surreptitiously. Uh, and mm. um, so that one hurt. But uh, I, when I speak about this to audiences, I always say, look, I refuse to define myself as a victim. There's a concerted effort to victimize me and so many others, not just me. Um, everybody's been through this, you know, uh, Pierre Corey, Paul Merrick, uh, Brian Cole uh, has lost a multi-million dollar business and most of his licenses. Uh, and there's one physician jerk who um, is responsible for a lot of those attacks. Uh, so it's happened to all of us. Uh, you can't fight it very well. The courts are so kludgy. It's really difficult to get a case of malicious defamation through. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, we could go into the legals. I've, I've now had to learn way too much about the law. Uh, hmm. but I, in, in a core, remember a core facet of wokeism is, uh, um, uh, victimization and self victimization and defining oneself as a victim and all that. Yeah, and I just refuse absolutely. to play into that. And what Good. I say to audiences is, uh, um, don't allow them to define you as a victim and don't take yeah. that as your personal identity. Refuse right. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a number of other roles that you can take. One of them, of course, is being a warrior, but you can be a mentor, a teacher, a parent, a caregiver, and all those can yeah. be mixed. You can be a warrior caregiver, which is, I guess, my wife tells me is what I am. Um, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, don't allow yourself to be a victim. Don't self-victimize. Yeah. That's what they do. Um, That's the Marxist frame, victim perpetrator. Yeah. I so mean, don't don't it's do a distortion it. of reality. Don't play yeah. into that game, and uh, yeah. and and choose a role and become that role. You will become that role yeah. when you do that, and uh, have courage. Uh, you don't have to be on the front lines. Uh, you know, uh, with your pike. Uh, at the tip of the spear, yeah. uh, I'm fighting back all the time, but uh, have the courage of your convictions. And remember, there's worse things than dying. Uh, and one of them is losing your soul. And the people that I know that make these little daily compromises, um, each so time good. you do that, it takes a little bite out of your soul. So good. And um, so true. So don't do it, you know, and, and, uh, yeah. Um, you know, so, if I if I can withstand all this crap, then you can too. Uh, yeah. And the other thing I counsel to my buddies, like we did over dinner the other day at the end of Shannon Joyce hit, uh, when we were all sitting around for dinner, I said, um, "Remember that we are all role models, and uh, many many people are watching us. And if we remain oh, happy absolutely. warriors." and don't accept the role of victims, then we're teaching everyone around us that's watching that they can survive this too, that they can be brave, they can stand up, they can speak out, 
and uh, they won't be killed. They won't be destroyed. And yeah. and I think that's that's super important. Brian Cole made an even deeper statement. Um, he said that remember in everything that you say, this may be the only gospel that many people ever hear, which mm. I thought was pretty deep. But uh, Ryan's yeah. a deeply uh, person of faith, so that's how he framed yeah. it. Uh, and and I think there's merit in that. Remember that as as we travel through time, and I have the benefit of more gray hair than either of you, uh, um, we we do touch a huge numbers of people as we pass through time. And uh, um, that's, that's an opportunity to do good. That may be the most important thing that we do is, is, how, is what we share and, and what we, how we, how we per- serve as, a, as an example and role model in how we comport ourselves. Uh, mm. which, uh, and there's all kinds of other stuff around that, you know, all the disruptors and chaos agents that are trying to force all of us into crazy land and snake venom and uh, programmable nanobots, and which all acts to uh, um, delegitimize uh, what we're doing and delegitimize our cause. We have to be, I think, really careful, at least I try, to stay balanced and level, calm, happy warrior, yeah. based in truth. Based in truth. Yeah, you. I, I just want to add this before we, I know we're coming to the close here, but the, it, it, it's incredibly inspiring to, to see someone like you out in a, especially a year or two ago, in such a controversial climate and to very calmly, you could just detect, this is a man who's committed to telling the truth. And uh, it's quite inspiring to see, and I know I don't just speak for myself. Well, thanks. I think the kindest thing I've heard in all of this and, and all of us have heard it that have been out here and at you know on the tip of the spear. Uh, the comment in various forms comes at us. I felt so alone, and I thought I was crazy. And then I heard you, and I knew I wasn't. I hear that from mm-hmm. nurses and medical practitioners and in just yeah. just people, and that that is so uh, um, affirming. Uh, that's that is the that's the reward, is knowing that you've touched people, and um, given them uh, courage, and uh, allowed them to proceed based on their own knowledge, belief, and perceptions, in a crazy mixed up world. Uh, you know, yeah. I I yeah, I'm older than y'all, so I remember the this film. Uh, it's a mad, bad, mad, mad world. Uh, and if you mm-hmm. haven't seen it, you ought to. It's a great comedy, but it absolutely applies to the present. It's it's very culturally appropriate. I'll check it out, Dr. Yeah. Malone. Well, thank you, Dr. Malone. This was it was an honor. I'd love to have someday do a 2.0 with you. I'm sure it'll happen. We can yeah. ex- yeah. Explore the next the next thing. <laughs> the next, I love you, I love you that wish you're, it. It will happen. I'm sure. I love I love well, that thank you're speaking you. on all these far-ranging topics from sovereignty to so many because I'm sure millions are just going to want to keep following your commitment to exploring yeah. what's true. Yeah, you know, it, it's hard to get into the next topic about kind of forecasting the future, but I but I really hope that somehow truth and good prevails somehow. So there's a school of thought that we, uh, number one, that transhumanism is a false religion and it will fail. And yeah. increasingly, a number of people are thinking that that I read, like Doug Casey's International Man, that uh, we're going to be, this is, you know, there's the whole logic of the fourth turning um, and the rise and dominance of sociopaths and psychopaths in government and industry and everything, and that this is, this is a cycle. You know, this is the wheel of time thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're in it right now, and we've got, uh, you know, three, four, five years of hell coming at us. Uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And, but it will get better. That's in, or you can go biblical uh, and talk about Lucifer and, and those kinds of things, uh, and, and you come to the same place. There's, there does seem to be this cycle that happens in the tide of human affairs. 
and uh, and we're in that yeah. dark part of that cycle. And uh, yep. the question is, can we maintain our fortitude? And are we going to learn something, or are we just going to redo the cycle, uh, or could we come out of this uh, with a different uh, consensus about how humanity should interact with each other? And, yeah. and uh, you know, there's a, a version of this outcome where we learn the lessons of the internet in that uh, we become uh, more highly matrixed. Uh, more able to share ideas, such as what we're doing right now. Um, yeah. You know, a, a future of a more decentralized information space uh, yep. and, and uh, where that could go. Uh, this is, you know, one of the hopes of uh, the, uh, you know, Bitcoin is a brand, uh, but the decentralized yeah. cyber currency, blockchain protected, you know, we can all those, add all these things to it. Uh, yeah. You know, that we get towards a more decentralized world that empowers the individual. Uh, you know, what does that look like without veering into socialism? And, and I don't know that any of us can really envision that which has never existed before. I think we're going to have to gradually evolve into it. Uh, but maybe yeah. that could be the good thing that comes out of this uh, time of testing. Yeah, yeah, intriguing. Well, thank you. You're amazing, man. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, Mullen. Really Malone. appreciate you doing this. Cool. Um, thanks for having me on, and and like I said, yeah. I'm sure we'll. Do you are indefatigable. I don't know yeah, how we you. Yeah, definitely need to. Where do you get your life energy? 64, and you're just tireless. Uh, Jeez. Uh, wife and farm. Uh, yeah, and, there you go. And it's you know in for a penny, in for a pound. If you know once you're in this, what are you gonna do? Yeah. What? Yeah. Exactly. You might as well be all in. Yeah. Totally. 100. percent Hey, we hope you enjoyed this show. Incredible. We could go hours with Dr. Malone couple things. Uh, be sure to check out his book if you haven't read it before. Lies My Government Told Me and A Better Future Coming. He's also got an upcoming book on uh, other topics. You could follow him along on his Substack at rwmalonemd.substack.com. That's free, but you could donate if you want. He's also got the maloneinstitute.org where you could download uh, kind of a deeper dive into the documentation behind a lot of his research. And then rwmalonemd.com. Thank you so much, Dr. Malone. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man on a mission. I'm a man on a mission.